Good morning and happy new year. This is Soccer Made in Portland on the North American Soccer Network. As you know, this is Mao speaking. You can see Kelly McLean uh, across from me. How are you, Kelly? Happy new year. Happy new year to you as well. I uh, hope you uh, enjoyed your New Year's Eve celebrations. I did. I had a very nice view of Jeldwin Field from the a very high floor in a building nearby. It was it was quite a nice thing to ring in the new year and, and not be too far from the stadium. Uh, certainly be spending a lot of time there in the coming months. So yeah. uh, I guess it was just a little bit of prep work. That's a good way to start the, start the new year with a view of uh, gelled one. It was, yeah. Uh, it would have been nice if it was lit up and all that, but it, uh, you know, the sign on the outside was, so that was that was good enough. Uh, yeah, we definitely welcome everybody back. Hope everyone had a, a good New Year's uh, celebration or quiet time or whatever whatever you did to to ring it in. But it is now 2012. We can now expect, for example, MLS to give us a schedule for the season. Uh, one of these days, anyway. Uh, we've been promised that a little bit before hearing it may come out this week. That would be nice. Uh, let me just give a few details on the show. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, we're on the North American Soccer Network. You can always find our archived shows there, video and audio, plus, of course, links to uh, all the other good shows on the network. We have an email address if you have any questions or, or comments or anything you want to uh, bring to our attention, and that is soccer.portland at gmail.com. So feel free to send in, send in anything there. We're on iTunes, and uh, the best way to, I think the best way to keep up with the show is uh, is to subscribe to the podcast, whether the audio or video or both. Um, and as soon as Trevor gets it up, it will be sent directly to your iTunes and, and you can start to listen then. So check us out there. You can find us by searching North American Soccer Network. You can search the show directly, but either way, you'll find it there without any trouble. And uh, every show that we've done so far, I think the first eight prior to this one are all there uh, for the taking. Uh, let's see. January 3rd is today. And January 3rd, 1980, I have a little bit of a different one here. Uh, with the with the Super Draft coming up shortly, I guess it's we'll have another show before it happens. It's on the 12th, Thursday, the 12th of January. Uh, but in that spirit, on January 3rd, 1980, the Timbers signed their only draft pick of the 1980 draft. Uh, I suppose the draft was late in 79, but ahead of the 1980 season, they signed goalkeeper John Binbo, uh, B-E-N-B-O-W, and he made one appearance for the Timbers uh, in one indoor game, and I believe he came on as a substitute and was scored upon in short time, and he never made an outdoor appearance, uh, a very short-lived Timbers career, but uh, he is on that list of all-time Timbers draft picks. I suppose he would count as the the number one draft pick for the Timbers in 1980, uh, one and only. But uh, there it is. So in in the spirit of the draft coming up, and, and we're going to talk a lot more about the draft, uh, particularly next week. I don't think we're going to spend much time on it today. Uh, we'll do some previewing next week, and then uh, the following week we'll of course review everything that happened, both from a Timbers and and an MLS perspective. Um, but getting getting back, and uh, I think. Getting back to sort of the regular show here, uh, I should mention we're going to have a guest. I should have mentioned that from the outset. Uh, you've probably seen it on Twitter. If you haven't, we're going to have Merritt Paulson, the Timbers owner, uh, president, and uh, whatever other title uh, he has in the organization. And he is going to be joining us at about half past 10 uh, or, or 1.30 on, on the East Coast. And we're going to have a couple of questions for him on uh, sort of what his expectations are for 2012 and and um, maybe some insight into some of the things that have happened late in 2011 uh, and, and that kind of thing. So look forward to that. We'll we'll, um, we'll have some hopefully good things to, to talk about with him. Uh, Twitter update. We should, uh, we should go ahead and get this out of the way now so there's an appropriate gap in between uh, talking about it now and then speaking with him again later. Uh, a couple of interesting tidbits uh, over the last week from Merritt. I'll let you go ahead and, and hit that. Well, the the first one 
was about the schedule. Um, he, he had said uh, on Twitter that the schedule is done, but that it wouldn't be out until January. And, and, and as most of his tweets, it came from someone asking him about that. Um, and then later, there was another uh, tweet from a, from a journalist, I think, that, that was sort of asking people to say, well, let's, let's use January 11th as the day and you know pick your over under um and so th- I, there was a little response there about well according to merit he said it, it would be out i believe he implied that it would be out this week i think um so maybe we'll ask him about that is uh when we get him on here a, a little bit later um but it sounds like the schedule is done and mls wants to I don't know, do what? (laughs) Wait until what particular day to announce it to, I don't know. I I mean, if it's done, put it out there, say it. Put it it. out there. I I mean, I I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, And there was actually a tweet this morning from the new Colorado Rapids uh, president, I think is the correct title. And he said that he had a draft of the, the schedule on his desk, basically. And, and was expecting it to come out this week. And um, yeah, so I guess that's two, two high ups saying, hey, you know, it's, it's, it's done. done. Um, and so I, I can't really understand what, what exactly MLS is waiting for. There's not a, you know, there's not like a significant event between now and the, the draft. This is actually a good week. I, I mean, I, I don't think there's a, a major announcement uh, to borrow an MLS Twitter term, um, that that is going to be overshadowed by the release of the schedule. Right. Um, so, and and I, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe they've even put out the entire first week schedule, have they? Didn't they only unveil the television games for first kick? I think so. I mean, they 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 said who would be at home, who would be hosting games in the first week. Well, they, I guess they listed the dates of home openers for every team, but they didn't necessarily say who the opponents were for every team. I think they've only announced the teams that were going to be on television. Right. Uh, I think those four games. I think so. Uh, but so it, that's even less than what they did last year. Right. Because they, which was admittedly later. That the first announcement wasn't. I don't think until January something. But they announced the entirety of the 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 sort of who would be the opponents. Right for yeah, everybody's home opener. Everybody's home opener, exactly. But yeah. I, 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 all signs seem to point though to this week, uh, presumably for that that schedule. Merritt also gave another little tidbit. Uh, he said there would be no Chicago away in uh, 2012. So presumably, if you'll remember details on the schedule you know the eastern conference clubs only play them once so it could be a home or away so um, that is apparently one of the uh, eastern conference teams that portland will host um, this coming season Um, so there was that little tidbit in there as well and i forget I, i think you had tweeted a list of than possibilities for away matches and home matches based on some other uh, information that we had as well. Yeah, well, I mean, we know Philadelphia is going to be here at home. And so that's two of the the possible Eastern Conference teams uh, that will definitely be here in Portland, which means Portland will definitely not be in Chicago, uh, nor will they be in Philadelphia this year. Uh, So yeah, you know, the list is basically just the rest of the Eastern Conference teams. But it... You know, the, from a travel perspective, which I, you know, is is the reason, at least the reason MLS gave for the for the schedule change. I'd much rather play Chicago, because that's a much shorter trip than I'd much rather have New England play in Portland mm-hmm. than have to fly to New England. If the purpose of this, I mean, if you know, if that's the point, they should be doing everything possible to minimize travel. Now, obviously, there's a lot that goes into, you know. Everybody can't only play, you know, the best possible schedule uh, in terms of travel. Uh, there are some uh, some things that have to give. But uh, w- one interesting thing that I also kind of thought about in reading that about Chicago, 
the, the Timbers only got 12 points away from home in, in 2011. And four of those came against Chicago and Philadelphia. They had a nil-nil draw in Philadelphia and a one-nil win in Chicago, two clean sheets away from home. And I think the only other clean sheet away from home was at Vancouver, uh, which was the other victory in, in 2011. So uh, away victory, I should say. So I'm not sure that, that necessarily matters, but it, it already we're seeing two places where the Timbers actually succeeded on, on some level away from home, which was the biggest difficulty all year, uh, or one of the biggest difficulties all year. We're already seeing those off the table. And so if the Timbers are going to pick up away points, uh, we, we already knew they were going to be more away games against Western Conference teams. We'll, we'll learn hopefully this week uh, against which Western Conference teams those, you know, the Timbers will play twice away instead of once away as it was this year, but or, or now last year. But that that's kind of an interesting one to, to have those two teams come in here. Uh, and both of those teams were defeated here in, in Portland last year as well. So, right. yeah, nice little nice little tidbit there. I, I think it's fair to say the Timbers fans probably know more about their schedule than anyone else, <laughs> except maybe Montreal. Because I think Montreal knows they were playing at Vancouver in the season opener, and then they've announced their home game against Toronto in April, okay. I think is the other... The other uh, the other game they've got going for them so far, and it should also mention that the those Eastern Conference opponents, the home and away, that will flip for 2013. So whoever we have at home this year from the Eastern Conference, the the Timbers will go away to those clubs the following year. So those will be, um, you know flipped you know from 12 from 2012 to 2013 so if it, if it sort of seems like it might be uh you know a couple of teams that we aren't getting at home or on the road this year that will end up happening uh in 2013 and then maybe you can speak to the last one here um real quickly i only saw a couple of th uh, things and i didn't read all of the the stuff that was going on about um, Merritt, I think, asked about trying to work the, the song Green is the Color into the production during during home matches of, of sorts. Yeah, it, w it was an interesting discussion. He, he brought this up uh, unprovoked. Uh, it, was, it was not, uh, as, as a lot of these things are, it was not in response to a question uh, or not directly in response to a question that, that somebody had posed to him or, or just in general. And yeah, he... he just wondered what fan reaction would be to the team working in Green is the Color, which is, a, I guess, in fairness, a song that goes back to Chelsea at least to the 50s, if not earlier. And it was sort of adopted and re-recorded here in Portland in, in 1975. And in Vancouver, as Green is the Color, Chelsea's was Blue is the Color. Vancouver, I think, recorded a version called White is the Color in... 77 or 78 something like that so it's it's kind of a long-term thing in, in both and uh, it's something that in recent months uh, the the guys who who wrote and sang the song Eric Beck and uh, I don't recall the other guy's name right at the moment but uh, they've kind of been trotted back out and done a few appearances and played the song and I think a few people have gotten kind of into it and uh, so Merritt just put that out there. And there was a lot of interaction. A lot of people just said, yes, that'd be great. Uh, this is something that people, they, they used to play at the stadium. I know uh, different folks in the Timbers Army used to go and, and sing the song at in the concourse at halftime. Uh, I don't really think that happens anymore, but, but there have been people who have suggested, hey, we should get this back out there. So a lot of the discussion was sort of about, uh, it had a lot more to do with sort of not the merits of, uh, no pun intended, of playing the song, but whether or not it should be even played over the loudspeakers, because there are a lot of people who are completely opposed to any music being piped in, lest it sound like an NBA game or uh, or somewhere where you know the lyrics are on the scoreboard. Uh, people uh, very much favoring sort of an organic, like you sing the song if you know the words, and and you should be you know, encouraging people to learn the words, not just have it on the screen and right. that kind of thing. And, and so it was, it was kind of a lot of that kind of discussion, but, but it seemed everybody, <clears throat> excuse me, was mostly in favor of it. And I, I think 
I would certainly be in favor of it. I mean, I think it's a, a nice link to the past. It's something that you could do pretty easily. And it's something that you could do that would include everybody. It wouldn't seem, uh, if you did it the right way, uh, it wouldn't seem as exclusive maybe as, as some of the Timbers Army stuff is. I think it would be something that could kind of work in the entire stadium and be something that uh, is, is about the entire club and the club's history and um, there, there are plenty of people who already know the song and, and know right. some of the words anyway. So, yeah, it was, it was an interesting discussion that that um, came up on what would otherwise have been a very, very slow day uh, on Twitter. I mean, it was a, it was like Sunday at noon or so, <laughs> you know. And, and Merritt put that question out there, and uh, yeah, I was, I was happy for that because it gave me about two hours worth of <laughs> conversation yeah. with both with Merritt and other people on mm -hmm. both sides of, or, or many different sides of sort of the same argument. So, well, it is uh, a catchy al tune. Always appreciative of that in the off season. Yeah. Well, it, it is a, a catchy tune. And like you said, you know, it kind of harkens back to, to the, the older versions of the timbers. So it might be, might be nice to try to work that in, in some fashion or, or another. Um, so it sounds like maybe we want to, uh, do our interview with Merritt a little bit sooner than originally planned. So I think we're going to take a quick break and uh, get Merritt on the line, and then we'll be back here shortly with Timbers owner Merritt Paulson. That's right. Okay, well, we're back from break, and we are very happy to welcome Timber's owner and president, Merritt Paulson, to the show. Uh, good morning, Merritt, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you guys. I, I guess uh, this might take away your uh, Merritt Paulson tweets segment of your uh, of, of your show today. It'll be much less interesting for you, you know, to to, to have me on to to remove ambiguity. No, we already we already did the Merritt Paulson Twitter update just to make sure we got it in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, l l actually, let me just ask you a, a, just a kind of a little bit of a random question. Do you have any uh, New Year's resolutions, uh, Timbers related or otherwise? Oh, I'm not a New Year's resolution guy, to be honest. I never have been. I mean, I always, my wife and I joke about stuff, and it's more on the, you know, typically the, the, the personal level. I mean, I my New Year's resolution for the team is the same one as, uh, you know, it's just our, our, our goals for the year, which have been well documented. You know, playoffs and where we're putting a focus on the U.S. Open and um, you know would love to get into uh, to CONCACAF whether it's through U.S. Open or, or being one of the top teams in the league. Well let's um, let's talk about something that that will come up a little bit before the season starts and, and that's the the preseason tournament uh, that will involve Chivas USA, San Jose Earthquakes and AIK the, the Stockholm based club uh, maybe talk about how that came together, where AIK came from, sort of what that relationship looks like, and, and how you hope to develop it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that was entirely 110% Gavin. Um, and uh, the the AIK relationship is, is one that, you know, he's very close to, to some of the guys over there. And, and um, you know, I think their, their relationship actually started in Africa. Um, uh, and, and where, where we've scouted and they've scouted and back to the, 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 the point in time um, where we signed Khalif on um, so a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, uh, he, he, I think he had, you know, relationships dating back to his player day, playing days uh, beyond that. But, you know, it's a cool idea. And, and the, the idea, you know, to, to, to have a team like AIK come in and uh, a couple other MLS sides and, you know, have more of our fans be able to participate um, in the preseason and and you know see some uh, some exciting international players in the process. Uh, it's something that I think is is a great idea, and it's 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 something that I'd like to do on an ongoing basis. I don't know if it'll be annual. They're really tough things to pull off, but but a, a goal would be to do something similar to that uh, uh, every year. Merritt, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the homegrown players. It, I'm wondering if 
I, I guess first of all, there have to be rules for for who can be classified as a homegrown player. But it really doesn't seem like any a lot has been published by the league, and, and so it, it sort of seems like there's questions about who can be classified as homegrown for which clubs. Are, are there hard and fast rules, and are they going to be or are they published for people to look at? Uh, it's a good question, Kelly. Um, you know, certainly there are hard and fast rules. Um, it's a very important rule. If if we're going to prioritize academies and developing our own talent, you know, not having a homegrown uh, mechanism in place would remove the incentive. I mean, you'd be putting a lot of money into developing uh, kids that, that you could potentially be losing to other, other teams. On the flip, you can't have teams running wild you know, suddenly claiming uh, every every talented player is, is is homegrown if 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 you know the 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 proper rules have not been met. Uh, and so, you know, it's it's very well structured, but it's it's been a bit more behind closed doors, um, which you know hasn't been a great thing. I think from a media standpoint, because there is some confusion out there. And you know, look, it's it's obviously. You know, we've got a lot of rules in this league, more than other leagues, um, related to player signings in general. Uh, it's complicated. It can be tough to understand. Certain, the single entity, you know, creates some of that um, confusion, but, but the single entity results um, in more good than not on a holistic basis. So that's a long-winded answer. Um, there's no ambiguity among teams in the league about what's necessary um, for a player to be a homegrown player. I'm not going to go through right now um, the mechanism, you know, the the, the 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 rules. But that is something I, you know, I think needs to be better publicized and better communicated um, to the media. On a related note, uh, potentially, uh, you guys have a lot of money tied up with Jorge Perlaza and Kenny Cooper, uh, and now with Jose Valencia, as well as bringing back a couple of other forwards in, in Bright DK and Eddie Johnson. Is the forward line in, an area that we can expect that you guys are done working with in, in this offseason and, and that the focus will be in midfield and defense uh, as we lead up to March 12th? Um, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna directly answer that, um, uh, Michael. Uh, you know, it's it's I, I'd say that you're gonna see an active January. You can expect an active January um, on the player side, and I'll, I'll generally answer that uh, question, not just at one position. And um, you know, there could be um, uh, new signings, new international signings. Um, there could be trades. Um, we've got a draft coming up. Um, so uh, I'm not I'm not going to say that any any position is is is, is set in stone right now, um, you know and and uh, you know I, I I guess that's the best I could do um, without without sort of tipping our hand at, at, at what we're looking at too much, um, you know I guess the most I I tell you is 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 right now uh, the the defensive line is a is a, is a focus for us, um, you know I would expect to see a couple signings uh there um you know you know in the next uh in the next several weeks just quickly kelly sorry just no, about uh valencia i just wanted to ask you how, how do you feel about how that signing went and and how excited are you to see him come in this month uh I, i'm extremely excited um and uh you know look I, I just think that the risk is putting too much expectations on somebody who just turned 20 years old. Um, do I think he can, can come can come in and contribute right away? You know, I do. Um, but but you know, it's not just his age. There's also an acclimation process you have. And you know, we've talked about this before. I mean, when you look at um, guys like Alave and and you know how how impactful they've been. But you know how. They, the fact that they they did need a time period to to acclimate, and you know, I, I was pretty happy with what uh, Perlaza and and definitely Chara, um, you know, how quickly they were able to acclimate last year. But but typically, when you have guys come in from other leagues, um, you know, there, there there is an acclimation process. So it's not just it's not just Jose's age, but over time, 
I, I think that, that that's a guy um, we, we have really high expectations for. But, you know, there's more risk. Um, you know, th- this is a guy that could be an EPL type of player, and, you know, you're not going to typically get those guys at, at, at 24 or 25 years old um, coming to, to, to MLS. Um, you know, the, the, those types of guys have been, been on the retirement uh, slope of their of their career typically um, uh, you know when they've come here and, and here we're taking a, a, a flyer on, on somebody who, who's you know potentially got that kind of ability and that kind of uh, career trajectory but we have to get that out of him it's on us and you know bright DK uh, by the way you know he's not getting talked about a lot but uh, you know he, he's older but uh, th- that's a guy who's who I still think we need to get a lot out of um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think we have high hopes for Bright as well. Um, so, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how, so, how everything shakes out. Mary, you mentioned a while back that you'd gone out to the training facility. Um, it seems initially like when that was first announced that the club had said that they thought it would be ready uh, in the summertime. W- were there some setbacks? Will it be ready for, for the start of camp? Well, it it uh, there were no setbacks. It was uh, you know it, it, uh, it there might have been some miscommunication initially or confusion within the, the coaching staff if that's who you you, you heard it from. Um, but you know the 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 locker room's basically ready right now. I mean TVs and um, that kind of stuff are, are are just going in. But all the plumbing and the the lockers and and uh, carpeting etc uh is, is is already in it's really nice um the uh, we don't want to play the field uh too much in the really wet weather uh and camp starts uh at the end of january so you know i would expect that the field might not be used um at least for hard training until maybe even as late as april and um, we really wanted to make sure that that you know, we don't we, we maintain it well for the long term, and you know the team's going to be um, in LA, and uh, you know we'll be doing some some preseason here as well. Um, you know, for for most of February. So, uh, at, at any rate, uh, you know the 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 center will be open for most of the season, but um, you know I wouldn't expect heavy training uh, until April. Regarding the, the, the release of the third kit, which has been out for about a month now, what's the public reaction been to that, uh, and, and how well have they sold? I, I've seen lots of tweets of, of people at Christmas you know, proudly displaying their uniforms from Hawaii to the East Coast. What, what's that been like from an organizational standpoint? I saw the, the Hawaii uh, tweet myself. That was uh, that was funny. Um, yeah, you know, it's been great. Um, really, uh, really positive reaction. Um, and I think we're almost through uh, the authentics, the the limited editions. Um, uh, should have the replicas out uh, in January of this month. I, I don't have to say in January anymore. Um, and I don't have a specific date for you there. Um, you know, the, the, the concern I had relative to this whole thing was, was always the pricing. Um, I felt really good about the design and where we were. But, you know, when we made the decision um, with Adi to produce it locally um, and source it locally, and uh, it, 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 that had pricing ramifications um, on, on the authentic and, you know, I, 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 we ultimately said, well, look, we're going to have replicas out that, that are going to be the regular replica price um, at, at a later date, and, and, and it's just a, too cool of a thing to use the recycled materials and do it all locally and, and, and really embrace our past. So, um, you know, that's where we came out, and, and I, I think the reception of the kit, um, both locally, mo- most importantly locally, but, but nationally, really couldn't have been better. I mean, you guys are the, the, the kit nerds, so to speak, or at least you are, um, Michael. And, um, you know, I, I don't know about Kelly, but um, I, I know that, uh, you know, nobody's ever going to love every kit, but there's always strong opinions. And then, you know, that's what makes it fun. And I don't think I've ever seen a, a launch that's had so little negative pushback. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been interesting to see reaction um, from some fans of other clubs not to be named um, who wished their team had, had done this uh, sooner. So, 
uh, Mary, maybe j one last question for me. I'm curious if you have a timeline for uh, replacing uh, Trevor James and, and finding a, a new assistant coach. Um, you know, we, we, we're in that uh, process right now, um, and I wouldn't give you a specific timeline other than to say, you know, I'd expect to, to have a replacement in the season. It's not an immediate need. Um, you know, the, the, the addition um, that we made um, uh, to, to, you know, our goalkeeper coach, Tosh, is, is, is really um, – uh, you know, going to be operating in a role beyond just a goalkeeper focus, and is really accomplished guy um, who, who uh, you know, we were thrilled to be able to get in uh, to the club. We've still got Amos, um, who's doing a great job. So, um, you know, it's not like we we need to get um, uh, uh, another assistant added uh, tomorrow. Um, we're going to really take our time and make sure that we get uh, the right fit. Um, so. Uh, I, I think that's the, uh, the the key thing. I mean, look, we've had a we've had a decent amount of shakeup um, in the assistant coaching ranks already, and um, you know, it's John gets the attention, but um, uh, we need to have the right assistants in there um, as well. Um, and uh, um, you know, we we've, uh, we 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 want to get this right. Well, one last from me, Merritt, before we let you go. Uh, is is there a worry? among the organization or, or in your, your office that the expectations uh, will be raised to a point where they might not be met in 2012? Or, or are you guys prepared for uh, the sort of expectation that the team will be and should be better than they were in 2011? Well, you know, we've got all of one year under our belt. We definitely should be an MLS Cup champ this year, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, no, look, I mean, nobody's got higher expectations um, than than we do, um, and we, uh, John, Gavin, um, and and myself, and and really that's you know so so whatever any um, uh, you know fans might want or expect can't get any higher um, than than we have, and and to be a successful team, it's not just about doing the right things in the locker room with player signings with coaching. Uh, you know, you also the, the reality is you need to have a little bit of a fortune um, regarding health of the team and you know the bounces of the balls and you know you hope over time with doing everything right that that you know you'll we'll be able to uh, achieve our goals. But you know, I I think that um, Spenny joked uh, with me when you know I was talking to a guy that that we were looking to uh, uh, sign recently. Uh, you know, did you tell him that? That it was uh, 34 0 and 0, um, you know, as the is, is the team objective for the regular season, um, you know, as is, is is you know anything less would be a failure, and you know they 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 joke with me about that, saying that that's what that I you know might have unrealistic expectations, but they do too, and and um, nobody's more pained. Um, I won't say nobody, but but they're just as. Um, is is upset as I am when when things don't go our way and and I, you know I don't think that's the case with 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 every single coach out there to be perfectly honest I really don't um, or or GM and and um, you know there there's a lot of uh, connection to the to the team and and the badge and um, we all want it uh, very very badly but um, you know you got to be realistic as well and and I think we've talked about this before on your show um, that, that the managing for the near term and the long term and the balance and this is a team loaded with youth and potential and this year we're going to have more maturity uh, we're going to have more toughness we still need that leadership and um, you know so so uh, you know I don't want to I don't want to give up the things that, that the foundation that 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 you know and the philosophy that um, has led us to build the team the way we have, which which ultimately, realistically, is going to pay more div dividends. Should pay more dividends in the um, midterm than it would in in the short term. But I think you saw last year we could be successful out of the gate. Um, there are other expansion teams that would have killed for our record last year, um, and uh, we should have been in the playoffs last year. We absolutely should have been in the playoffs. I mean, you look at the team, the games we. We, we gave away the points we gave away the Toronto home game um, you know uh, New York Red Bulls would you know yada 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 and 
I, I'm, you know, the, those everybody can sing those sob stories in every team's, but you know, w- we all recognize that it, that it was there for us, and um, you know, with making no additions or improvements, we should be a playoff team this year. But but um, you know, that's not that's not the ambition, just to make the playoffs. Um, so. I, I think that that the team should improve. Uh, Seattle in their second year saw, uh, a, you know, they had a real slump to start the season, um, and, and a lot of teams have a, a little bit of a letdown um, in, in the start of the second year. Uh, second year, and that's something that we're concerned about and focus on. Seattle obviously righted the ship towards the end of their season, and um, you know went ahead and made the playoffs and won the um, the the U.S. Open Cup, but. Uh, that was a very long-winded answer uh, to the question. <laughs> well, given the amount of uh, other information out there at this time of year, we're happy for all the exactly. <laughs> long-winded answers we can get. Uh, we we very uh, very much thank you, Merritt, for a couple of expected, minutes this expected morning. Expected an uh, active January, guys. It should be should be a fair amount for you all to talk about, and um, a lot of irons are in the fire. Um, uh, schedule should be out this week, the MLS schedule. So. Uh, lots of stuff going on. The combines um, going to be in gear um, uh, very shortly as well. So um, you know, it's exciting time. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. Yeah. So thanks again, and uh, we will talk to you very soon. See you guys. Thanks, thanks Merritt. And we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back in a minute to talk about all that. Well, many thanks again to Merritt Paulson for giving us a few minutes. That was fantastic and uh, very insightful. And uh, there's a lot going on behind the scenes that I think we all know. And uh, I, for one, am very much looking forward to some of that coming out into plain sight. Um, but I'm I'm curious to to see what you think about what he said about the assistant coaching uh, position that it that it wasn't necessarily uh, a need based. Uh, situation at the moment, and it, it sounded like he had pretty high praise for Amos McGee. Yeah, I, I mean, I basically I, I would agree with him. If if that were the position that I were in, I, I would definitely be f- putting all my energy and focus towards players and signings and what's going on there. And I mean, obviously, not that it's on the back burner, but. It's probably not something that they're putting all of their focus and attention and energy into. And it sort of follows with a lot of the things that, that they've done. They've, I think they have tried to do things right as opposed to do them as opposed to doing them quickly or on some type of timeline, you know, some sort of, random timeline that that fans or media or anybody else thinks they should be adhering to I I think they they've they've sort of set the tone and stuck to it that that they want to do things a certain way and they want to get it right and they want to do it the way they think it should be done and not based on what anybody else thinks should be done or whatever timeline somebody else thinks uh, they should be you know trying to adhere to yeah, and you could really hear Merritt saying that at the end about sort of the sort of the ethos of the club, if you will, just sort of the way that they they knew they they might not have the most successful first season uh, of all time, but that it would be sort of paying it forward for for future seasons uh, to do things in in a way that that they say is is the right way or or the way they envision a, the way a club should be run or put together or uh, th- that decision-making process. I, I, it was also a little bit interesting to hear him say that that Mike Toshak will have more of a role than just goalkeeper coach. And and I guess thinking back to, to when we spoke to him a couple of weeks ago, that I can sort of hear that coming through now where he was saying, you, you asked him kind of what's the role of a goalkeeper coach and you're kind of off on your own. And he was saying, well, it has to do with how much trust there is in, in the level of comfortability between the head coach and the assistant. And then he went on to say that he and John go back a long way and they, they feel very comfortable working together. And I guess now we can sort of see that as a sign that it, not that he necessarily knew that there would be a coaching assistant coaching change uh, apart from his own introduction, but that he will be very involved in the team uh, in a way that maybe uh, Adam Smith was just 
involved with the goalkeepers. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't just because someone is a goalkeeper coach, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only thing they're doing. Um, and if you've got a guy with a lot of good knowledge about the game in general, you know, he may be your goalkeeper coach, but, you know, you, you may want to get input from him on any number of, of other things if that's a guy that, that you trust and, and has that knowledge. Um, yeah, absolutely. You'd want to you'd want to use that, you know, to your advantage. So that you know that could be another thing that's that's helping them out, knowing that Toshak can you know give some input and fill in maybe just a regular assistant coach type of role in addition to being a, a goalkeeper expert, if you will. And in fairness, he was a full time assistant. Uh, not specifically a goalkeeper coach uh, in both second division uh, roles where he was in Vancouver and, and in Montreal, he was not uh, at least labeled specifically the goalkeeper coach. He, he was uh, an assistant coach. Uh, well, let's, let's talk a little bit. Merritt talked about um, sort of the homegrown player process. Right. Uh, and we did not on, on purpose uh, ask him to confirm or deny uh, anything about Brent Richards, the, the Timbers, under 23 player over the last couple of years, University of Washington product. Um, the, the the UW coach, Jamie Clark, was quoted in, I guess it was sort of a, I don't know if that was a university publication or, or just sort of a, a website that's about uh, UW sports. But uh, the, the, the coach up there was quoted as saying, Brent Richards will sign a homegrown contract with the Timbers this week. <laughs> yeah, uh, there <laughs> not a lot of wiggle room <laughs> no. uh, in that statement, uh, and that that was published on on December thirtieth. So that would go into the forward line uh, idea. Uh, another player who is definitely a, a forward. Um, but I'm curious what you think about that if it's true, and kind of maybe what that means in terms of wider MLS homegrown players. Yeah, I I mean, he basically said what we sort of already knew, which is there are rules and guidelines for homegrown players, but they really haven't been outlined or made available to the fans or the media. I don't know. I, I, I kind of wonder, you know, why is that? It really makes it sound as though they're – there is some gray area with some of those those rules that there are still some things that they're working out and we know that there have been teams that have tried to claim some players as homegrown and they've been denied so I mean if the rules were that clear and set then we wouldn't have clubs <laughs> trying to claim players and you know being denied so yeah or at least they wouldn't be denied. I mean, clubs wouldn't try and claim unless they knew they were right. going to get it. Exactly. So I don't know. That whole thing is still. I'm still really curious about about that whole situation. And 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 I I think like a lot of other people, I'd like to see those guidelines, um, and and what some of those restrictions are. Uh, there have been bits and pieces. I mean, I think we've referenced and talked about before something that the New York Red Bulls posted on their website, like a little tidbit about college players and having to, you know, designate them beforehand. But that hasn't been substantiated anywhere else. It would be great to actually see the requirements, the rules, the regulations, so, because there are a lot of questions, you know, regarding Brent Richards and and some people saying, well, how can the Timbers claim him and you know, how come, you know, wouldn't the Sounders claim him and yada, yada, yada. And I, I mean, it would just, you know, that sort of transparency would go a long way to, to clearing up a lot of questions, but it just begs the question, are there really those rules out there? Yeah. And it, it, obviously it's the Sounders fans first who are, who are going to re reply negatively if, sure. if the, the Brent Richards news is true, because well, he went to college in Seattle. He's actually from Washington, mm -hmm. uh, even though it is certainly uh, much closer to Portland than it is to Seattle, uh, where he's from. And uh, yeah, it, it's a weird one. I mean, he, you know, I don't believe anyone has ever been granted homegrown status where one of the 
the sort of pillars of evidence was that they were involved in a U23 team. I, I mean, I, uh, that U23 teams are not uh, officially affiliated with clubs in the way that academy teams are. Right. Uh, and and so without having an academy, it's it's I think the previous understanding, or, or what's at least being put out there by people who maybe disagree with with, with uh, the possibility of Brent Richards coming to the Timbers in this way, is that players had to have some involvement in an academy with the club in order to be qualified to be a homegrown player. And there have been some exceptions. Uh, I think Zach Pfeffer, I think is how you say his name, at, at Philadelphia, I don't believe they had an academy set up. Uh, before he signed as a homegrown player. I know the, the young guy that just signed with the Galaxy, uh, I forget his first name, Villarreal is his last right. name. I believe he's gone, and I think he previously had been in their academy, but had not been for the past year. So th there are, like you said, there's obviously something, there's more to it than what is sort of generally or popularly known. Um, I don't know you know, if, if Brent Richards is, in fact, signed by the Timbers uh, as a homegrown player. I don't know that that means we'll be given any additional information about that. Right. We may just find out that yes, in fact, he has been signed as a homegrown player, um, and and not necessarily given the evidence to support that. But yeah, I, I would definitely uh, not that uh, what we say necessarily matters. But I, I would encourage MLS on some level to to just give some guidelines, even if it's loose. Um, you know you. Uh, or, or maybe a list of things you can't have done uh, in order to be uh, considered for homegrown status. Um, because if, it, you know, presumably the whole system is set up uh, upon precedent. So there's got to be some instance where something like this has happened before, or maybe this is going to be the precedent. And if that's the case, then I think a lot of people, you know, I saw somebody say this is, you know, this is a Pandora's box. If, if it's true, because then it, you know, a team with no academy and with no youth teams is claiming a player after college as a homegrown player, a sort of a retroactive homegrown player status. And if that's true, then a lot of teams are going to start making a lot of claims right. on a lot of different players uh, who are out there. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see kind of how that plays out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I would expect that he will, at the very least, uh, be in training camp. Um, he is not going to the combine. And as a senior player, a uh, collegiate player with lots of experience and lots of accolades, why wouldn't he be going to the combine? Right. Um, so I think it's clear there's there's something something going on. Um, but I, I fully expect to see him at the very least, even if he hasn't been announced as signed yet. Uh, you know, the same as we saw Freddie Braun last year or right. guys like that. Uh, at, at training camp in the early days of camp. I, I think we will see Brent Richards there. Yeah. And it, I, you know, I'm not quite sure Do, when, when the super draft comes around, they're only selecting players from the combine. Correct. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if, if it's necessarily limited to that. I don't know if players mm -hmm. skip the combine uh, if they know they're going to be like generation Adidas guys, I don't know if they right. go to the combine or not. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm I, actually not sure. Yeah. I mean, I would, say, I would wonder, I think most of the players who are drafted are at the combine because they're, they're right. at the combine because they've signed an MLS contract and they're, and, and I think it means that at least one team has expressed interest in drafting them at some point. Mm -hmm. But I, but I don't know that that necessarily means that everyone who's drafted is, you know, I'm not sure if the inverse right. is also true. Exactly. So, I mean, um, it, you know, is there that, you know, that list of, of people that, that are eligible to be drafted and is, is he on that list or, you know, we know he's not in the combine yeah. can, uh, it would be yeah. interesting to see if the timbers, uh, I mean, I don't think it, if he's, going to be signed as a homegrown player then they're not going to draft him right they're just going to sign him and they're not going to waste the draft pick on a guy they're going to sign anyway yeah. uh if the homegrown status isn't true and they have some sort of arrangement already made that they're going to draft him i, I don't know we're, yeah. we're going to i think we're going to get a little bit of light shed on this in the next in the next couple of weeks uh, but it is a really interesting case because of the circumstances mm -hmm. and the precedent that's out there uh, in terms of drafted players and homegrown players and 
and and of course homegrown players have a huge impact uh, in terms of salary cap because their right. their salaries do not count against the salary cap at all, and that that is the as Merritt said that's the big incentive is to is to bring these players in, a they're young, b that you've developed them on, on some level within your club, so hopefully with an eye towards Portland Timber soccer or whatever you you know whatever that that means. But the main thing is that they don't count against the salary cap. And and if they're good and they're young, you can kind of get away with um, a little more wiggle room, I guess, uh, in terms of salaries. And, and maybe you can shift things around to pay certain guys more money up front uh, and, or, or backload other guys' contracts in, in ways to, to, to be creative within the, the salary cap. So um, that would be a big addition uh, and also subtraction uh, I suppose uh, in terms of the timber salary cap because they did not really have that last year um, uh, really the only thing was um, well Darlington Nagby as a generation Adidas player and then uh, Troy Perkins having the, the the deal for his mm-hmm. wages being split in some in some way with DC United well, let's uh, touch on a few other things here before our, our hour is up. There, uh, there was an article out of uh, Jamaica um, about Lavelle Palmer. Um, he's apparently been working out quite a bit, uh, hasn't been, uh, as, as some players do, just taking the time off and uh, lying on the beach. It sounds as though he's been uh, doing Maybe quite, doing both. Maybe doing both. <laughs> sure, probably doing both. Uh, but a few interesting comments came out of that. Um, you know, he talked about the the impact that he felt he had. Um, maybe he and Chabala together once they came um, to Portland. And you pointed out something pretty interesting uh, to me that I, that I hadn't really thought about or, or looked at one way to look at the pre Palmer Chabala games and the post Palmer Chabala games. And, and you'd said that at the time they came, they were in 14th. Is that correct? Yeah. The, the Timbers were in 14th place uh, at the time of their arrival. And I think the week afterwards, which was a loss I think uh, the first game was. I think the first game was at Columbus. I think Lavelle Palmer right. played Lavelle at Columbus. Played. Chabala did not play right. in the first game. He played in the reserves in the next reserve game, and then they both started the following game. Right. In in the in the time that the that sort of that second half of the season, once they came, they rose up to twelfth, and they they won five, lost five, and had six draws. And I mean that's kind of interesting because it doesn't it doesn't sound all that great, you know, <laughs> to be honest. But then I I sort of countered with with the goals against it, through the first eighteen games, the Timbers had thirty one goals against. F- for the final sixteen games in which Palmer and Chabala played, they were only scored on seventeen times. So th- there's I mean just like anything it kind of depends on which data you want to look at it how you want to look at it Um, but you know clearly you can you you know you can make a case either way for their impact and particularly you know just maybe Palmer's individual impact but he he definitely made a point of saying that he he thought he helped um, sort of stabilize things a little bit and at least help the club get some points and make a run uh, for the playoffs yeah one other way to think about it and I didn't write this down but they were if that that one five lost lost five drew six is sixteen games, so they played eighteen games before sixteen games after five wins and six draws is twenty one points. So they had twenty one points in the first eighteen games, twenty one points in the last sixteen games. Mm-hmm. So if they'd had that rate, they would have been. I, I don't know. I don't. I still don't think they would have been higher if they'd averaged. 21 points out of 16 instead right. of 21 out of 18. I don't think, not that you can do math like that in real life, but the, the impact was, I, I think the, the word he used was, and, and you used, was stabilized. Right. And I think that's probably the, the, the best way to describe it. it. It did not vastly improve the Timbers. It did prevent them from a f- utter freefall uh, in in some ways or, or um, just made that back line a little more... Um, 
I don't know, trustworthy is the right mm-hmm. word, but just a, a little less likely to uh, give up some of the big plays and, and, and easier goals that some of the teams had been scoring in, in the first half, as you said. Right. And then he also mentioned uh, sort of the discipline. Um, maybe I he later on talked in the article as well about sort of the player quality. Um, and, and I have some, a, a rant that I would go on. But why don't you talk a little bit about what he said as far as the, the discipline that you thought was interesting? Well, he sort of said that that he again, this was an article in Jamaica and, and he was probably it, it did not really have the it wasn't sort of a Q and A question, uh, Q and A interview. It was mm-hmm. it was an article that included quotes from an interview. So it, it's it's impossible to know exactly what the question was, but he basically said that he thought that that players in Jamaica were just as good as players anywhere else, and that the the main difference in the U.S. in addition to uh, playing surface being better. Uh, which makes everybody better. He basically said everyone in Jamaica would be amazing everywhere else. They could play with their eyes closed if they got to play at home on the surfaces they get to play on in the U.S. But he, another thing he said was uh, sort of the the level of discipline is different in, in MLS than he was used to having, having played in Jamaica. Uh, and basically said something like, yeah, it's really tough. You even have to go to practice when you're hurt. Right. <laughs> It was kind of like, okay, what what did you do in Jamaica when you got hurt? You just I, hung out just, at home and I guess skipped so. practice. I mean, it was just a really weird way of of. I think what he was trying to say was that the the intensity is much higher. That there's a a much more uh, sort of consistent level of intensity across the organization. So it's not just what are you doing when you're on the field, when you're healthy at practice, but hey, just because you're injured doesn't mean you don't come watch training. You do, you do your rehab at the practice facility with the rest of the team, with the team trainers, you know, every, team, 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 everything is done together. Uh, I think that's what he was kind of getting at, right. but it, the way it came out was very yeah. strange, as if he'd never heard of the the idea of actually going to practice when he was hurt. Uh, and it was, and he was hurt a little bit, um, you know, nothing serious, but he, he was not necessarily 100% healthy down the stretch. And and I don't know if that was just different. He'd obviously been in Houston before as well, but uh, yeah, it was just kind of <laughs> kind of a funny thing, kind of a fun, interesting perspective. Yeah. And I think he might also have been kind of talking about maybe not for him so much, but maybe just for, you know, the some of the people that he knows or younger players back in Jamaica that, that sometimes that's the, the feeling as well. Why do I need to go? Maybe maybe it wasn't so much pertaining to him as maybe yeah, just right. his perception. Yeah, because he was talking uh, about Jamaican players right, in general, right. uh, not not just him, him. But but he He's definitely a, was talking yeah. from his experience, and it right. was yeah, it was kind of a yeah. <laughs> kind of a funny line. And I just ha- I. You you mentioned it how he talked about playing surfaces and how if there were a lot of players in Jamaica who were good quality maybe if they had a better playing surface that they could go toe to toe with other players around the world and I just. I can't stand that argument. I've heard that argument forever in so many different ways. It's like, you know, when I was growing up, I played in, you know, in bare feet on rocks. If only I'd had a nice field to play on, you know, I, I would have been great. And it just it just annoys me. I don't like it. If that were true, then Barcelona would have terrible fields for their youth academies. And I don't think they do. <laughs> You know, I mean, if it really makes you better playing on terrible surfaces, then that's what clubs would do is they'd put all their young players on terrible grass surfaces, but they don't because it doesn't make you better. It doesn't. When I was in college, our uh, our practice field was horrendous. It was there were holes, there were bun- it, it was a nightmare. And I mean, you're not that you're going to say anything else, but our coach would say, you know, hey, you've got to have better skill to play on this field. And obviously, you're going to put a positive spin on it if that's your only option. But, you know, it it's such a detriment in so many other ways that it doesn't make you a better player to play on a worse surface. Golfers love to say the same thing. If I wasn't playing at the public course with the terrible greens, I'd be a much better putter, you know. And it's just... 
I just can't stand that. If that were true, basketball players would shoot on 15-foot hoops growing up. You know, well, I can, you know, it, it doesn't make you, it doesn't make you better because of that. It hinders all of your other areas of your game. And it's the same thing with that touch. If, you know, if you're playing on a bad field, what it means is that you slow down and you play more cautiously because you don't know where the ball's going to go. It's going to take funny hops. It's going to do all kinds of weird stuff. It doesn't mean that you have better touch. It means you're slowing down so that you can adjust to, you know, those bad bounces and the terrible field conditions. And that's impacting, you know, the overall greater game. And I was really disappointed to read that quote because I just that just always sticks in my craw whenever I <laughs> whenever I hear people say that I can't stand it. Well, let's let's quickly close with uh, just a uh, one note about Jake Gleason, and this is I was doing a little bit of looking. Uh, I think most people know that he's in New Zealand at the moment, and, and I believe, although I was unable to verify this before we went on the air, that uh, the New Zealand Olympic team training camp basically the under 23, they call them the Ollie Whites. Uh, They, I guess, are in camp now or or will be in camp very soon in preparation for the qualification tournament, the Oceania pre-Olympic football tournament, which is in Fiji. Now, everybody knows New Zealand has one of the easiest cakewalks in the world to get to any tournament. I mean, they play the likes of New Caledonia and, you know, Vanatau or whatever. I mean, but regardless... From March 12th to 27th, New Zealand, their under-23 team, their Olympic team, will be qualifying uh, in the qualifying tournament for the 2012 London Olympics. Now, everything that we've heard leads us to believe that Jake Gleason is, if not one of the goalkeepers on that roster, the number one goalkeeper on that roster. So that just and i maybe i'll just leave this as an open ended question or an open ended thought for and, and we can talk more about it next week or or whenever but march 12th through 27th is i mean we obviously don't yet know exactly how many games the timbers are going to have in that time span but they will have one and that's march 12th right. uh so if jake gleason is qualifying with with new zealand which i think is a good thing in the long run i think it would benefit the Timbers to have a player playing in the Olympics, even if it means he's gone for part of the summer, uh, and just in terms of international stature to have that happen, and good for Jake's development uh, to be playing regularly, which which would also be good. He's got to be there in Fiji in most of March. Um, so that would leave only Troy Perkins at the moment as goalkeeper for the Timbers, uh, obviously, Merritt mentioned training camp going to start at the end of the month, uh, of this month, and I assume Jake will be back before then. But you know they're going to need to figure something out. So we'll we, we've talked to, about goalkeepers before, and we'll talk about them again until we until we learn more about the deal. But um, I just want to leave that out there as something food for thought. My my last thing: there is no more curse. Brisbane Roar finally won. They defeated the equally pathetic Melbourne Victory 3-1 on New Year's Eve. Uh, so I am no longer the curse for, for Brisbane Roar. Congratulations. They have broken. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, they've broken their, their five-game losing streak. So uh, thanks again to Merritt Paulson for giving us a few minutes. Uh, you'll be able to find this and all of our other archive shows on iTunes, on the North American Soccer Network uh, website. There are also RSS feeds there if you don't like iTunes. Uh, so, yeah, check it out. And we will be back next Tuesday with a little bit of a preview of the MLS Super Draft. So until then, uh, this is Mal. And this is Kelly. Talk to you then. See you next Tuesday.